Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Nandini Gokul Chandra. Um, I'm the Deputy Director of Neurogen Brain and Spine Institute as well as Consultant Regenerative Medicine. And I welcome you all for this webinar, all the participants who have joined and who will be joining shortly. So today's webinar is about recent advances in the medical management of autism and cerebral palsy. Uh, majorly, these are the two conditions I will be talking more about. However, this also applies to other incurable neurological conditions, especially in children and some of them in adults as well. So it's good to know what's happening in the world. It's good to know uh, what is the scientific data which is available and what more can we do for our children. So generally, uh, so why are we here, right? So as I said just now, uh, we are here to understand what more can be done for, for our children. There would be in the participants, I'm expecting there would be parents of uh, children with special needs. There would be caretakers. Uh, there would be possibly doctors, therapists, professionals, and those who are related, someone near and dear one, someone you know who has uh, a special needs child or individual. So we are here to understand what more can be done for our children. So if, if you look at the uh, paradigm, if you look at uh, the general, so if you look at the current paradigm for treatment of conditions affecting the brain, what is known? What do we know? We know or we have been told by everybody uh, including our um, uh, family doctors and other doctors, that there is no cure for this condition, <laughs> that there is no surgery which can be done. Means there is no cut, you can't open up the skull and, and change or, or uh, remove a tumor or anything to get your children to do better. There's no surgery per se of the brain which can repair or regenerate the brain. Only rehabilitation. You have to keep doing rehab, you have to keep doing therapies uh, and and uh, work on uh, the, the limbs to work, work on the brain to do better. So rehabilitation is the only, uh, you know, pillar or cornerstone for treatment of neurological condition, especially autism and cerebral palsy. And there are no medicines which can repair the pain. There is medicines only to control the symptoms, but, that, but there are no medicines which can repair the brain. This is what is understood and known uh, all over. So what is new? What is new that you are going to understand today uh, apart from rehabilitation? So if you keep rehabilitation at the center of the whole process of treatment of autism and cerebral palsy, what we have added is two new team members. So that's how like, I like to introduce these new recent advances. You have a team which is, which is experienced, which is which has been there for a long time and has been, you know, day in and day out uh, playing for you uh, to help uh, your child become better. And that's a rehabilitation. But somewhere you find that the rehabilitation is is uh, having limited uh, outcomes. That, you know, it, though it is experienced, it is, it is well known, but what you need is an, an infusion of fresh blood. You need an infusion of energy and enthusiasm a new know-how so that the team which treats your child becomes more effective. So experience combined with a newer enthusiasm and, and that's where the cellular therapy and integrative therapy adds on and these three now become a very strong team. So into your team of rehabilitation, now we are going to add two more team members. One is cellular therapy and other is integrative therapy. So let's know more about this. So when you have a fractured leg, here you can see there's a fractured, fractured leg. What do you do? Do you start walking immediately or do you start doing rehab or exercise immediately? No. What do you do? You first fix the fracture, right? You fix the fracture and once the fracture or the, or the bone is healed, that's when you start the exercise or physiotherapy to strengthen the muscle for you to be able to act you know, uh, walk better. But suppose you start doing exercise with a fractured bone, what will happen? You know, your fracture will worsen. Similarly, for the brain, you can see here 
on one side is the brain where you can see blue, green, yellow, red. The green, yellow, red indicates good functioning brain and the blue indicates low functioning brain or a damaged brain. So when in a damaged brain, you do therapy, you do rehabilitation, you are not really helping that brain. You're not helping the child and maybe you are actually worsening because you're pushing the child to do things which he or she is not capable of doing. And here you can see that the blue has become green. That means that the brain is now learning, the brain is recovering and the recovering brain will give you better response with the therapy. So we are not, you know, substituting the rehabilitation. What we are doing is adding power to the rehabilitation. So what is the old thinking? You will tell me, oh, but we have been told that, you know, once there is a damage in the brain or if there is something wrong in the brain, you can't really repair it. So that is the old thinking, that is the old dogma, that once the nervous system is damaged, it is incapable of regeneration. The new thinking is that not, if not complete, some amount of regeneration is possible through the process of cellular replacement and repair. And this is something which we have seen for about 15 years now. We have we have seen it scientifically in the brain. We have seen it in children who are doing better. So what is the old view? That keep doing therapy. A lifelong, keep doing rehab, rehab, rehab. What is the new th um, view? That with rehab, when you do uh, early intervention, where you, with, you do intensive cellular rehab uh, therapy and you add integrative therapy, with this intensive program of three things together, it is possible now to reverse cerebral palsy and autism. I know this is a big statement, but this is something which we have seen periodically. Every week we get to see a, new, a child who is doing better and better and integrating into the school. So cellular therapy is an idea whose time has come. It is not fiction. It is no longer uh, like a Star Wars movie. It is something which is, which is happening now and which is possible now to treat our children. So to make you understand more uh, what is cellular therapy, uh, let's go back and, uh, and remember that till now we have been told that we have experienced two types of treatment in modern medicine. One type is, the, is medicine, giving med, uh, drugs, giving tablets, giving syrups, giving injections, right? That's what you know for it. There is a fever, you give medicines. And if there is a tumor, you do a surgery or if there is a heart problem or if there is a by, uh, there's a clot in the heart, you do a surgery, you do a bypass or do a stenting. So one is a medicine and one is a surgical procedure. What do we have now is something which is neither a medicine or a tablet orally which can be taken or an injection uh, which can be put into your veins or neither it is a surgical procedure. What we have is cellular therapy. It is a new paradigm of treatment where you do not cut, you do not stitch, but you are inserting uh, tissue or cells into the particular part, either the brain or the heart or the liver, wherever there is a problem. And this is a process known as cellular therapy. <coughs> so this therapy helps you <coughs> excuse me, to go from hopelessness to hope. So this is like, a, you can see what you can see, what is you've heard of stem cell like where does it come from this is a stem of a tree you can see a stem here a very small sapling giving rise to leaves uh, here so just like a uh, uh, stem gives rise to branches and the branches give rise to leaves and flowers and fruit the cell uh, the cells that we put in will multiply and, and make branches or many many uh, cells like their own and then give rise to but depending on where you put them, if you put them in the liver, you can form liver like cells. If you put them in the heart, they can put make heart like cells. If you put near the brain, they will make brain cells. So this is a stem. And if you see with fertilizer and with water, proper nurturing, then give rise to branches and similar cells like its own and, and then give rise to different parts of the body. So this is Stephen Hawking talking about this new concept, we know he was a Nobel laureate himself suffering suffering from a neurological condition. <laughs> Sorry, I've put the video again.
So what is Stephen Hawking talking about? He's talking about special power in our body, which have the potential to regenerate our own tissues. And that's our own healing power. And that's what I'm going to talk more about today. <clears throat> so if you look at stem cells, what is their potential? What can they do? What would they actually do? So one cell can become many, many hundreds and thousands of cells. That's the potential. They can multiply into a cell of its like its own and one cell which will be like the environment or surrounding. So one cell can become thousands of cells. Then number two, you can improve blood supply in the part that you have put. So most of the conditions or disorders that we see is also because of lack of oxygenation, the lack of blood in the in the different parts, you know, or, or either it's brain or liver or heart. So increasing blood supply. Number three, convert into the, the particular type of cell where uh, the, they get the cues. So if you put them in the liver, they can become liver-like cells. If you put them in the heart, they can become heart-like cells. If you put them in the brain, they can become brain cells. And most importantly, they release growth factors, hundreds of growth factors, which can stimulate the repair and regeneration of the brain. So this is how the stem cells will work. This is what they do once they reach the vicinity of the damage. So they can repair, they can regenerate, and they can replace. <laughs> so you know, what is the difference? Let, us, let me explain, giving you an example of how things have changed over time. In 1990, if you had to read a book, you needed actually a hard, <coughs> hardcover book, right? If you need to calculate, you needed a calculator. If you, need, if you needed to click pictures, you needed a, a Canon or a Kodak a photo uh, camera <coughs> if you needed to do a video graphing you needed a video camera if you had to watch television you needed a proper uh, television set or if you use I need to use computer you needed a pc right but all of us know that things have changed over the last 20 25 years now with one phone like like an android phone or an iphone you can do all of these activities in one phone that's the uh, that's the example which suits the stem cells perfectly. Like a stem cell can do have multiple actions, as I showed. It can improve blood supply, can can regenerate the tissue, it can stimulate or release a lot of growth factors, it can prevent the cell death. So all of these, which different medicines will do, one stem cell is able to do all of this. It's like a multitasker. So this is a promise of of cell therapy that if there is a damage in the brain, for example, these are the blue areas which are damaged, the cells can go and stimulate and stimulate repair process and thereby improve the brain functioning. <clears throat> now, there can be two types of uh, procedures. One is autologous, that is we take from our own body and put it back in our own body, that is known as autologous. The other is we take from somebody else and put it in the body of the patient, that is known as allogenic. Yeah. Now, the sources of stem cells, that means, are different. The processing is different. And the way you put it into the body is different. There are different types of stem cells. Where do you actually get them from, depending on that? So, you have, we, we all started as embryonic stem cells. When we were in our mother's womb, we were one cell or two cell stage. And these cells did uh, multiplied multi many, 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 many times. And once they are a bunch of cells, then they differentiate into different parts of the body as well as the covering of the child. Now, these embryonic stem cells, which we get from in vitro fertilization clinics, have the potential to form any type of cells in our body. Right? Now, uh, but the problem with these are they are somebody else's cells. These are not our own cells. And they have an ethical issue that you are killing an embryo and they have the potential to form tumors. So remember that embryonic stem cells have the potential to form tumors, not all type of stem cells. So in view of these two ethical issues, as well as possible medical complications, use of embryonic stem cell for clinical transplantation in patient has limited value or feasibility. But we have other types which, have, which don't have this long-standing issues. We have cells which can be taken from umbilical cord. Umbilical cord blood cells, as you know, a child and the mother is connected with a cord and this cord contains blood cells. It, it, this cord contains a different uh, blood which goes to the child and from the mother and uh, blood which goes from the mother to the child as well. So 
this contains a lot of uh, stem cells which can be used for that particular child because these are the child stem cells or the mother stem cells so this can be stored for the child's use sometime later this type of stem cell has been more studied for blood disorders or hematopoietic disorders now there is of course uh, our own stem cell which stephen hawking talked about that our own body has the capacity to regenerate and the most commonly studied uh, uh, stem cell in our body is from the bone marrow and bone marrow as you all know is the place where blood is formed it is a factory for blood <coughs> blood is formed every day when we donate blood the blood is reformed in our bone marrow those who eat non veg understand it very well when you chew a chicken uh, leg and when you uh, you know you know that the leg is hollow and you tap it you can see that there is something which comes out of it so it, this is where the so bone marrow is a hollow place in the bone where blood is formed continuously so the cells which form the blood can again be a very good source of stem cells these are the child's own cells these do not need to multiply uh, they can be used instantly after the bone marrow is removed and, and special cells are separated they never form tumors they do not have any rejection issues and become a very attractive and feasible simple and safe source the other sources from our own body are the fat stem cells or adipose tissue stem cells which uh, is taken out during liposuction uh, through the process of liposuction these cells also have lot of uh, you know cell uh, multipotent uh, potential now these cells hence become a very attractive as i said and very potentially feasible option for use in uh, for medical transplantation in diseases and conditions of our body to treat and repair where there is no other treatment option then the fourth is the uh, induced pluripotent stem cells these are also adult stem cells but they are then you know reprogrammed to become like small babies or like embryonic cells and then they become your own cells these are not somebody else's you have not killed an embryo and this particular ipsc has a lot of potential and is still being studied so then uh, the, when people say that one that stem cells are banned and number two that stem cells have lot of side effects they are actually combining the uh, different it's like combining uh, all different type of cells and putting them in one basket it's like saying that alcohol and homemade orange juice are both beverages and hence they are toxic to our body Uh, so you have to think before you know when they say stem cells are banned we uh, we understand that uh, it is not the fda is not approved it this is goes more for the embryonic stem cell the embryonic stem cell is like alcohol it needs licensing it needs uh, you know lot of it it is like a drug uh, under the um, fda or even the indian fda but if you look at homemade orange juice made by the mother with lot of love does it require any licensing no so homemade orange juice uh, is like taking the child's own cells and using it uh, for the child's own uh, repair process it can be used for liver it can be used for heart it can be used for bone it can be used for brain and it's also being tried for diabetes at neurogen pain and spine institute our experience over the last 15 years we have chosen to work with adult stem cells we have looked at all these other types of cells and uh, weighed their pros and cons and found and found that uh, using the child's own bone marrow is the is the best it is safest there are no long term side effects there is no rejection issue it does not form tumors ever uh, it is easily obtainable using a very thin needle and there are no ethical issues we are not killing an embryo hence use of bone marrow autologous cells uh, is is what we decided we will use now why do we put into the spinal fluid now many people ask us why can't we put intravenous so yes there are three ways that we can reach the brain right we believe that autism and cerebral palsy the problem is in the brain and we need to repair the brain so what is the easiest way of entering the body it is like when you infuse yeah right you give 
fluid in the IV. In the same way, the, anybody can inject cells in, intravenously. But when you inject cells intravenously, just imagine where is it going? Through the IV, the, the blood first goes into the right side of the heart, right? This right side of the heart, the blood is pumped out into the lungs. When the uh, cells go into the lungs, it gets filtered. So as the oxygen gets filtered and the CO2 comes out, same time the cells get trapped in the lungs. About 50% of the cells will get trapped in the lungs. And from the lungs, then it goes to the left side of the heart. And from left side of the heart, it is then pumped out. When it's pumped out, this blood goes to all parts of the body. So it doesn't just go to the brain, it goes to all parts of the body. And when out of 100, suppose we say 100, from out of 100, 50 got trapped in the lungs, 50 somehow reached the heart. From this 50, when it goes everywhere, maybe 5 or 10 may reach the brain. So just percentage. So when it reaches the brain, even these cells, it's difficult for them to go into the brain because now the brain has its own protection. Brain is covered by meninges which acts as a blood-brain barrier. So even cells reaching into the brain becomes very difficult. So if it's simple, it doesn't have any long-term issues or even no, no possible risk, maybe minimal risk, but the efficiency is very, very low. That is one, one extreme way. The other extreme way would be directly injecting into the brain. So when you inject into the brain, yes, the cells will go directly in, but imagine that you are poking through the through the brain, which could possibly be normal. Plus, when you see the brain scan, you see that not just one part of the brain is affected, different parts of the brain are affected, both in cerebral palsy and autism. And reaching each of these different parts is not easy. You go through normal brain as well. Plus, it poses higher risk even of death. So that's why we have found a middle ground. We have found a middle path where we are injecting the cells into the spinal fluid you can see here right so this is the brain and this is the spinal cord okay the cord ends here somewhere at l1 after that it is just the nerves and you can see here that this spinal cord is protected by this bony vertebra okay so between the two vertebral column vertebra there is a space through this is where the needle will go in and it cells are left here transfused here and with this fluid which goes all around the brain and spine the cells will reach the brain through this what we are doing we are targeting the brain going as near the brain near the brain as possible we are crossing the blood brain barrier and and that's why we are able to reach very near the brain without damaging it so parents generally have two questions for me which i would like to address here Number one, how do we know that the cells will reach the brain? <clears throat> we know that the cells will reach the brain because we are injecting into this place which where the cells are either in touch with the spinal cord or the brain. It cannot go anywhere else in the body, number one. Number two, when we look at autism, cerebral palsy or other brain disorder, there are different areas of the brain which are damaged. These are the areas which are also inflamed and these inflamed brain will send out chemicals, skews or signals which will attract the stem cells towards them. Along with that, the training and rehabilitation will help them reach the brain. Okay, So they are very near the brain. They are in fact into this fluid and they will reach the part which is damaged. And that is known. That is a known fact that has been shown multiple times. <coughs> And we are not injecting into the brain or we are not touching the spinal cord. Okay, where cells are injected into the fluid after the spinal cord ends. This is called minimally invasive. It is safe. There are no major side effects. We have treated over, over 15,000 to 20,000 patients uh, so far. And we have not had any side effect, long-term side effect like infection or damage to the spinal cord ever. Home, the cells will home on to the injured brain. And there is no dilution in any part of the body. So here, it's, a, it's, it's like you have a target and you're reaching as near the target as, pos as possible. So it, it is easier to reach the part rather than giving intravenous. So what are we doing? We're taking bone marrow from the patient's own body, injecting into the 
uh, separating the cells and injecting into the spinal fluid. So as I said, there are different ways that cells can be injected, uh, intravenous, intracerebral. Some people also give through the nasal uh, puff uh, for it to reach the brain. Again, it has to go through various perforations, intramuscular, very slowly it may reach some part of the brain. <coughs> so instead of going in a roundabout way, we are going directly to be able to be more effective. So what is the scientific basis for cellular therapy? Is it something which has come yesterday? No, there has been a lot of research. There are multiple three Nobel Prizes uh, which has been received for this work over the last 30 years. First, the demonstration of stem cells in the bone marrow uh, by Dr. Thomas, uh, 2007. Uh, the, the demonstration of or isolation of embryonic stem cell in mice by Sir Martin Evans and recently in 2012 for the concept of induced pluripotent stem cell to John uh, Gurdon as well as Shinyayama. At Neurogen also last 15 years we have been doing a lot of research and we have done research on various uh, different uh, conditions that we treat and published 107 uh, peer publication in various national and international journals. When you say peer-reviewed, it means that all the data is reviewed by other experts in the field. It is validated, it, the credibility is checked, and then it is published in the journal, which gives you authentic information. So whatever we say here comes from this published data and the data that we have analyzed uh, to be sent for publication. We've also been... Uh, in view of our experience, uh, we have uh, been invited to write book chapters in various textbooks which are coming up on 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 autism, on cerebral palsy, on pediatric conditions, um, uh, to write a, a chapter on recent advances in stem cells. So this is a chapter in cerebral palsy in a book on physical disability, muscular dystrophy. This is our... Uh, uh, director Professor Alok Sharma giving a book that we have written on neurological condition to our Prime and Honorable Prime Minister, who is a big supporter of stem cell research and therapy. When he, when he became the Prime Minister in 2014, in fact, he went to Japan to meet uh, the Nobel laureate Shinya Yamanaka to understand how uh, IPSC uh, uh, concept can be brought to India for uh, stem cell uh, to treat sickle cell anemia. He's also written a, a preface for a book that he wrote on muscular dystrophy. So this is a prime minister talking in the parliament for us. It's a big honor that he supports stem cells, the research of stem cells, and uh, and he's spoken in the parliament about about it, which is a big deal. So how is this treatment done at Neurogen? So the treatment is done. It's in a very simple procedure. There is no cut. There is no stitches. Uh, what we do is we take the bone marrow from the hip bone. You can see here. This is the hip bone the left and the right, you can see a needle here, okay, it's not in the joint, it is in the bone here, so in the front of the hip, not even the back, so the child is very comfortably lying in the back, is sedated or anesthetized and doesn't feel any pain, a thin needle goes into the hip bone and the bone marrow is aspirated, you can see here being aspirated, that's a 10 minute procedure, it doesn't take a lot of time and then in a few hours, the cells are being separated in the laboratory here you can see and then once the cells are already injected into the lower back lower back up to the spinal cord ends so it is not being injected in the spinal cord it is injected into the spinal fluid so simple procedure this is a, a video where you can see bone marrow is like thick blood and from this thick uh, blood like bone marrow which is centrifuge uh, and then what we can see from the tube that the red cells go down and we get only the mononuclear cells or white cells which are being injected. 
So this is uh, the process, very simple. There is no big surgery. There is no cut. There is no stitches. In fact, after the procedure is done and after two to three days when we remove the, the dressing, there is no mark whatsoever. Okay. So this is the bone marrow uh, aspiration, uh, separation, you can see. And, uh, and here you can see that the bone marrow is separated, uh, is being, is been, is being uh, processed. And here is what you get. You get this co uh, combination of various cells in very uh, concentrated form. Almost 100 million cells, mononuclear cells, are uh, finally separated to be injected. And the quantity is small, but we can't put a whole lot of quantity into the spinal fluid. Otherwise, it will cause a reaction. So a small amount is injected into the spinal fluid. A little of the CSF, uh, this is checked. So the cells are checked. You can see the number of cells, huge cells. And then a needle is inserted in the back. Uh, as, um, uh, cells are, the CSF is aspirated and these cells are injected. So that is one part of the treatment and along with that I said that I will introduce one more uh, new uh, team member which adds on uh, to this process of cell therapy and enhances the result and that we call as an integrative therapy. Why? Because it integrates into our process very well. So there are different kinds of integrative therapies and I'm going to talk mainly about two or three which are relevant for the children at present. So for the first is the hyperbaric oxygen therapy and we call it loosely as oxygen-based therapies, okay? So here what you are seeing is a chamber, right? This is a chamber like a space capsule. The children is what children have given this name, a space capsule, right? So in this space capsule, the child will be lying uh, 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 without any problem along with the parents. And you can see here there is a screen. So this is a screen so that children are, you know, engaged. Uh, once the uh, child and with the parent is inside this capsule, the capsule is closed and 100% oxygen is delivered at slowly increasing pressure. So one day it would be at 1.3 pressure. The next day it would be 1.5, then maybe 1.6, 1.8 like that. About 10 sessions up till 1.8, not more than that for brain condition. So 10 sessions in a row is what we initially recommend. So what is the principle of uh, hyperbaric oxygen? What are we doing here? Okay. So when you look at this, you see the upper part. The upper part shows a blood vessel or, the, or a vein or an artery in which you can see these red cells are flowing. So this is a red cell, this is a white cell, and this is the fluid medium of the blood. You can see this oxygen, right? The two molecules. So this is the oxygen inside the red cells. So normally when we breathe, we breathe 20% oxygen from the air, okay, and at one atmospheric pressure, right? We know at sea level, we call it as one atmospheric pressure. When we deep dive, the pressure increases. When we go up into the air, the pressure rarefies or reduces, right? So here, when we breathe normally, the oxygen which goes into our bloodstream is carried by the red blood cell. And which part of the red blood cell? The hemoglobin, right? So hemoglobin of the red blood cell will attach to the oxygen. This is at one atmospheric pressure. Now here, what are you seeing? You can see the difference in upper part and the lower part. In the lower part, what you are seeing? This oxygen is not only there in the, in the red blood cells, but it is there in this fluid medium. Can you see so much oxygen diffused into the fluid medium? What does that mean? That means that as the pressure increases, 100% oxygen which is delivered in that space capsule, this 100% oxygen goes and floods mm -hmm. the bloodstream. It is not only carried in the red blood cell, but it diffuses into the plasma, it diffuses into the bloodstream and now the whole body is flooded with oxygen. So when the body uh, blood is flooded with oxygen, more oxygen reaches each and every part of our body, even the nooks and corners where these red blood cells cannot reach. Right? Very thin capillaries. So imagine your brain and very thin capillaries going into the brain where the red blood cells are not reaching blood, 
the oxygen is reaching. So that's the difference. That's the beauty of oxygenation. Here you can see under normal pressure, you can see the oxygen is being carried okay, in, in the blood here. And here you can see in hyperbaric, the whole brain is flooded with oxygen. Now, what does this do? One, it does, it stimulates the brain cells. It stimulates the stem cells, okay? And increasing oxygenation helps the cells live longer. So, it improves the survival of the stem cells. It improves the multiplication potential of the stem cells. It prevents them from dying and hence their action remains for longer time and they become more effective. <coughs> this to show you the process. You can see the child is <coughs> dying comfortably and is, is enjoying the screen. Most children love the hyperbaric oxygen process. It has shown to increase the uh, nitric oxide synthase causes stem cell mobilization. Uh, it has shown to enhance the engraftment and tissue repair in various uh, stem cell and bone marrow transplantation. It improves the cell's process of reaching into the brain, improves blood supply and angiogenesis, oxygenation. It reduces inflammation. And after the transplantation, in bone marrow transplantations for other conditions, it has been seen that the uh, cells are able to home in and they are able to survive longer. So we do use it in autism, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, intellectual disability, in stroke, in traumatic uh, brain injury or head injuries. Uh, it improves the metabolic activity in our, in our brain and our body uh, in case of stroke and muscular dystrophy and in spinal cord injury. Uh, improves the oxygenation of the nerves and uh, muscles. <clears throat> It helps to re uh, repair the wear and tear in our body. It is also a modality used for anti-aging. So various different conditions can be treated using hyperbaric oxygen. We are now focusing my, I'm focusing my talk on autism and cerebral palsy at this point. But there are contraindications. What, are, what? When is it that we cannot use hyperbaric or do not recommend for safety reasons? One is active seizures if the child is having seizures every day or you know once a month then we would not recommend but uh, a minimum gap of one month from the last seizures is is needed to start the hyperbaric process if there is a visible metal implant outside outer part of the body if there is ear perforation or grommets <clears throat> if there is any lung fibrosis if there has been a lung surgery or a cardiac surgery if the patient is on oxygen support if there is acute pain and, and there is infection in the ear or the patient or person has claustrophobia or if blood pressure is high or very low or, you know, if there is deranged vitals, then in this condition, hyperbaric oxygen is not recommended. So this is a process for you all to see how it happens. This is called a monoplace chamber. Uh, that's what we have. But there are other places where there is a multiplace chamber. Here in this, only one patient can go in at one time. In multi-place chamber, it will be like a room or a small space where a person will sit and use a mask or a hood to <clears throat> get the oxygen, 100% oxygen. Here, the whole body is perfused with oxygen. You're breathing. You're, even the skin is breathing 100% <clears throat> oxygen. And the whole uh, chamber is pressurized. So in this, you can see that person is lying comfortably, is watching television, he's happy. The only thing you may um, feel is a little your uh, discomfort for example when you go up the flight and when you're coming down you have this your ear and nose gets blocked some sometimes it may happen so you are suggested to you know, swallow your sputum so uh, so the saliva so that that ear opens up or uh, in children we put nasal drops to keep the nasal passage clear to prevent any ear pain <coughs> so that was about hyperbaric oxygen therapy the other oxygen-based therapy is the ozone therapy. <clears throat> now, ozone, what is ozone? What we have heard ozone is in terms of the environmental ozone and we believe or understand, we understood till now that ozone is bad, ozone is bad for the atmosphere. But what we are talking here is medical ozone. What is medical ozone? Medical ozone is basically in the cylinder you have O2. O2 is converted to O3. 
So as you know, oxygen is, is two uh, oxygen atoms together forms the oxygen molecule. And in ozone, you can see along with this two, which has a good strong bond, you have another oxygen, which has this, a very unstable bond, a single bond, right? So this is the ozone. And this is an unstable and, um, molecule which gets activated very easily. So this is an activated oxygen by breaking this bond. So O2, O3. O ozone is O3. It is activated oxygen. And what does it do? It kills unwanted viruses, bacteria, and fungus. So it is a natural antigermicidin. It can be used as an antibiotic. It can be used as an antifungal. It can be used as an antituberculosis. It can be used as an antiviral without the actual chemical. So it's a natural uh, molecule. It reduces the inflammation and swelling. So anywhere in the body, if you have a knee inflammation, if you have a uh, wrist inflammation, if you have a brain inflammation, it will reduce. <clears throat> Number three, it reduces clots. It you know thins out the blood so that the blood flow is improved and the clotting is prevented. Okay. Number four, it is an antioxidant. Most of the um, conditions or the problem in our body is because of oxidative stress and uh, ozone is an antioxidant. <clears throat> so because of this, uh, it becomes a very attractive, very simple way of, you know, killing unwanted uh, germs in our body. So in fact, we used it in COVID as well. It can be used as a sauna. We can, uh, like a steam, along with steam, you can use it as a sauna. sauna you can... These are chronic sinuses and, you know, TB by using Boto, which I will show you shortly. So this is the ozonator here. This is a machine. Here you can see this blue tube through which the oxygen goes in. And this is this tube, the oxygen come, the ozone comes out. So it improves oxygenation throughout the body. As I said, when you give it rectally, it improves the gut health. So very good, very important for uh, children with autism. And it has a potent antiquity. So it has all these different, you know, benefits. So there are different ways that ozone can be administered. It's a, you know, it's an amazing molecule. <clears throat> I'm personally very convinced. I've taken it myself, so I love ozone. So per rectal, what is per rectal? Give it like an enema. Children in children, we prefer the per rectal route as it goes into the rectum. It cleanses the gut. Uh, in the gut, it breaks, O3 breaks into a O2 and O minus, and the O2 gets absorbed into the bloodstream, and O minus kills unwanted bacteria and, and, and detox the toxins. The other can be ear insufflation using a stethoscope. I will be showing you this process. Uh, uh, through the ear uh, drum, the cell, the oxygen diffuses and goes directly to the brain. So brain condition, uh, we prefer during uh, doing ear insufflation. So in children, ear insufflation and per rectal. Boto is breathing ozone through oil. You can you should not directly breathe ozone. It is toxic in a direct form for breathing, but when you pass it through oil, then, and you breathe the oil fumes, then it acts as a very good medium to cl clear your throat and your lungs. And those who have chronic sinusitis or have cough, cold, or even in post-COVID syndromes, we have used Boto. IV ozonized saline, means in saline is diffused with ozone and this concoction, and then given intravenously, it again cleanses the whole body uh, it has been used in COVID for prevention of COVID as well as for treatment of COVID. Ozone sauna, which I said like you sit in a sauna and steam and ozone together is a very good medium. Fun local for hair, for healing of the wound. You can do a local funneling of the <coughs> with ozone of that particular place. So local application. It's possible. It can be injected into the joints, around the joints. It can be given intramuscular for different indications, right? So these are different ways. Here is the ear insufflation. You can see this lady with a stethoscope and oxygen is given through the hollow part of the stethoscope, the ozone. So this is Boto breathing ozone through oil. You can see this is the oil, okay? And the ozone will come out from here and go into the, through the nose. This is ozone sauna. This is intravenous uh, ozone being given in COVID patients. This is ozone uh, given to the ear. You can see uh, the oxygen. Oxygen going in. Ozone is a gas coming out. 
and this person yeah that's it. <coughs> so this is the way of giving ear ozone so i have already told you so where can we not give ozone if there is a deficiency of a enzyme known as g6pd g6pd is a enzyme which will uh, metabolize ozone and prevent it being in our body for too long more than necessary so if this if there is if there is deficient in our body then we will not give ozone intravenous or ear uh, if there is acute bleeding like if you are in your menstrual cycle or there is a bleeding then cannot be given hyperthyroidism okay not hyper hyperthyroidism we cannot give if there is ear discharge cold or if there is history of seizures or eeg ear uh, ozone cannot be given but rectal ozone can be given so that is uh, one term gut cleansing using hydrocolon is more for adults so i'm not talking too much about it so acupressure deep tissue mobilization increasing oxygenation by uh, by stimulating various pressure points is again ad additional treatment that we give as a part of improving oxygenation in our body so generally in children with cp and autism we suggest this along with uh, Uh, cellular therapy and rehabilitation 10 sessions of hbot 10 session of ozone and 8 session of deep tissue mobilization at least so that's why a two week protocol to kick start the repair process so let's look at the results now i know we must be uh, waiting for how do we uh, how are we able to help children with autism we know what autism is it's a neurodevelopmental condition more seen in boys than in girls uh, it is a spectrum it can be mild it can be moderate it can be severe <clears throat> mainly three issues poor interaction poor socialization repetitive behavior and impaired communication and why do we need to worry because the numbers are increasing the prevalence is increasing it is uh, 1% of the world's population is affected with autism earlier it was One in one fifty in the year two thousand. In twenty years, it is one in thirty six now. So numbers are increasing exponentially. And parents, of course, ask why me? What is the reason? We may not always know that, but there are a few theories. And one that can be because of genetic factors. We believe it ten to ten ten to fifteen percent of autism could be having genetic predisposition. But almost about eighty percent to eighty five is. Caused by environmental factors, and now these can overlap and and cause the problem. So genetic involvement, we have seen lot of siblings, and of late we have seen so many siblings, siblings, and and in the generation as well, in the family as well, uh, and there are uh, publications which <clears throat> suggest that there could be a genetic cause. So we do not know the exact. Uh, genes but there could be a genetic cause <clears throat> and environmental factor again lot of theories but there could be prenatal and antenatal causes if the mother is stressed out hemoglobin is low vitamin d is low uh, a, a very abnormal high and low levels of folic acid both are not good uh, now uh, uh, then iron deficiency uh, diabetes in the mother hormonal issues Uh, depression in the mother, all those could also influence the child's development in the womb. Intestinal dysfunction uh, in the mother could also be a cause of autism or intestinal dysfunction, and the child comes out could add to the problem of autism. Toxins like high heavy metals, but when the child is developing in the mother's womb, lead has been known to cause brain functioning affectation uh, when in very high levels. Mobile phones now there is. Increasing information about use of mobile phone properly, electromagnetic waves reaching the uh, affecting the the brain, uh, the covering over the brain and making it more permeable so that toxin can enter the brain. So that is also one possibility. So what is new? Just as we are looking at treatments, new we should also know what is new in terms of understanding of autism. Uh, so when we look at understanding of autism, we are looking. We have uh, uh, tried to understand from the brain perspective. We believe that the problem is in the brain. Whatever may be the cause, finally, it is the brain which is getting affected. The brain functioning, the brain circuitry, the brain networking is affected. <coughs> Here you are seeing a PET CT scan. The PET CT scan of the brain tells us which part of the brain is functioning less. So this is the brain 
when you see from side view. Uh, so this is the front of the brain. If you can see my cursor, the top of the brain, the back and back and below. Now, green, yellow, red is good functioning brain. While the blue here that you can see is working less. So the brain uh, inside is affected. So if, we can, if I can show you. So many people uh, find it difficult because, of course, uh, as medical personnel, we know that brain is three-dimensional. So I'm just showing you the brain here, right? Can you see the brain? Yeah, so, so this is the brain when you see from the front. This is the brain when you see from the side. So when you see from the front, I, I'm opening it up. This is how you see it. Okay, can so you, now you can see the picture here. So this is the front, this is the top, and this is the back. Okay. <laughs> So this part here, here you can see is blue. This is called the cerebellum, which is functioning less. Then you can see here the medial, the inner part of the brain. This for medial temporal, which is working less, and the part which connects the two brain uh, is called the thalamus. When you open it up, okay. So this is uh, this is so the major brain, the cere the cortex is all fine, but the deeper parts are are much more affected, and that leads to different problems. So if you if you look at the areas, the, the, the smaller brain is a cerebellum for, for, this is for fine motor activity, coordination, balance, articulation, chewing, swallowing. Also, this is like the traffic police of the brain. So whatever the main brain needs to do, this will, you know, execute it. So if on the crossroad, okay, there is, there is no traffic police or the traffic police is inefficient or the signals are, you know, have gone for a toss. What will happen? There will be a chaos and be a jam. So whatever the brain input gets the input. Processing and output is a problem in children with autism. So these blue areas, they are working less. <clears throat> now, this is not something uh, which we have just seen, but we have also analyzed and we have published it uh, in the World a Journal of Nuclear Medicine. This is a very detailed analysis of what we have found. And in, in a gist, this is what we find when you look at the brain. This you can see this graph is shows. The blue graph shows... A neurotypical brain, the metabolism of neurotypical brain or how the brain is functioning. Okay, so you can see the first, within the first five years, the brain functioning is increasing and then after 10 years, the, it is increasing but slower. So this is a neurotypical brain. In a in a, a brain of a child with autism, initially the metabolism is high but as time goes by, it seems to be going down. So that's where the problem, so around two and a half years is when the uh, this is going below a normal Instead of going up, it is going down. And that's where you start seeing the different features of autism. So what do we need to do? What we need to do is push this graph up early, right? When you push it at two, two and a half, three, what are you seeing? You are able to get it to normal faster because the gap is less. So that's why it's called early intervention, right? As the time goes by, the gap increases. So it's more difficult to push uh, the graph up. So earlier you treat better the results and that's what we have actually found in our results also that if you treat within five years, you see the best results. So what does the management of autism really imply? It is not just one thing. You have a whole lot of rehabilitation, then you have cellular therapy and then you have integrative therapy as well. So all these together is what is going to help. Just doing rehabilitation doesn't help it. It is not enough because it does not address the core problem in the brain uh, that which what addresses it is the cellular therapy and the oxygen based therapy together and then the rehab then when you do the rehab you see better results so uh, we have so how are we able to say this we are able to say this because we have analyzed and we have published this in scientific journals the first ever publication which uh, speaks about use of autologous bone marrow Derived mononuclear cell therapy in autism came from Neurogen, came from India in 2013. So that was almost 10 years back, uh, where we looked at 32 uh, individuals with autism. We looked at various clinical uh, scales and we found that the improvement is significant. We looked at various domains which are affected in children with autism, like social relationship, emotional responsiveness, speech and language, communication, behavior sensory aspect, cognitive component, all of these seem to improve over a period of six months uh, in, in, and, and show significant improvement in all these children. <clears throat> so we see improvement in different domains. Uh, after that, in 2020, we uh, published an article in the American Journal 
of stem cells where we looked at 254 patients and in 254 patients over a period uh, of seven and a half months the age range from two to 34 years and we found a few things which are important yes there is improvement in many of the most of the domains but we also found improvement in the in different scoring patterns but what we found that if you look at the CBRT, all CBRT show improvement. Uh, age, this is the most important, uh, you know, graph that you see here. What we found is that when you treat children below five years, we have almost 97 to 98% success rate. Between five to 10 years, it becomes 94%. Between 10 to 15 years, 90% and 15 years and above also 90%. So as the age increases, the possibility of success reduces, uh, but, or rather if you treat early, it, you get the best results. If you look at males and females, improvement is almost uh, comparable. And if you uh, look at how soon have you come after the diagnosis. So if the child is diagnosed today, if you have come within one year, you're almost likely, 100% likely to get a good response to the cellular therapy. <coughs> Between one to five years, 95%. And about five years, 90%. So earlier you come, the better. There's a lot of literature. Different people in the world have used different kind of cell therapy and found different results. The first publication from India, second from China, third from Italy, US in fact, fourth and fifth, sixth again from India, seventh, Vietnam, Iran, and then US. So apart from cellular therapy, we all, uh, from, the, from the clinical assessment scales, we also looked at the brain scans and you can see that you can see before the treatment, the blue areas are now uh, green and blue has reduced. That means that the brain is now healing from inside. You can see all the blue is, is reducing. So brain is healing from inside. And as the brain heals from inside, when you teach that part, which is healed, that learning of the brain improves because now the brain has more raw material to work with. People ask me over a period of time, does the effect recede? Or does it go back? So you, this is the brain scan before the treatment in 2012, 2013, 2014. You can see that the blue part is reducing and remains reduced and the green part increases. <clears throat> so yes, definitely the improvements are sustained. This is another example. You can see blue part, blue areas, now green. The whole brain is now activated. Okay, these are a few examples. Now... Uh, as I said, we have now introduced a third uh, uh, new member that is the integrative therapy. And for the first 10 years or 10 to 11 years of our work, we were doing only cellular therapy with rehabilitation. Last three to four years, now we have added hyperbaric oxygen therapy and ozone therapy along with cellular therapy and rehabilitation. And we always keep on uh, uh, relooking, reinventing, uh, upgrading, and analyzing. So analysis of really is this working uh, is very important, and we have we have looked at data of about a thousand patients, uh, thousand one hundred seventy to be precise, where six twenty three only had cellular therapy, okay, and two sixty five had a combination of cellular therapy with uh, integrative therapy with oxygen based therapy, and then we compared how are the results. So we, uh, when we look at a bigger cohort, of course, the results looks a bit less. But if you look at comparison, that only cell therapy uh, overall, if you look at all ages, there is 87% uh, improvement, possibility of improvement. While when you combine with integrative therapy, the uh, this increases to 91%. When we looked at symptoms with only uh, cell therapy, you do see about 40 to 50 percent of various symptoms improving but when you combine it uh, with uh, integrative therapy you find better results uh, when we looked at only sct versus uh, uh, clinical assessment score also there is comparable in, uh, difference in the score outcome 82 percent to 89 percent 89 percent that is almost seven percent better improvement or better result when you add on oxygen based therapy uh, when you look at age, I find that this is one of the most important uh, understandings or uh, readout. Yes, there is improvement in younger ages also, almost to 90%. 90 uh, though the improvement comparison in terms of difference appears to be slight, but the maximum difference uh, that integrative therapy has helped uh, is the older children. So those who are above 10, we find that the results are suddenly increased 
by almost 20% and 50% over 15 years. So uh, as the age increases, integrative therapies add on to the response of the cellular therapy. And even the PET images, we find that drastic Im improvement is seen in many of these areas after the cellular therapy. You can see a thalam is not working at all and is working better. <coughs> so this is quantifiable, both quality and quantity wise, there is improvement when you add integrative therapy. So that is a question many people ask me, so I wanted to answer up front. So uh, a lot of scientific uh, articles uh, we have, we have published almost 16 articles in autism piece. All of that is available online and I request and I suggest that all parents do educate themselves and go and refer to this freely available on our website. There are no major contraindications to combining various treatments. We just may suggest a little gap between the treatments. For example, chelation or TRS, we say, you know, give a gap of three years. Biomedical treatment also give a gap of about a month uh, after the treatment. So let's see a few examples. This is an example very, very proud of uh, because uh, in this child, not, have, not only have we seen immediate results, but we have seen sustained results over a period of eight to nine years. So this is, uh, when they ask, what is the best case scenario? This is one of the best case scenarios. This is a child who came to us when he was 10 years old. And this young, he's a young man now of 19, 20 years. When he came to us, he came he came from the US. Yes, at that time, he was mild to moderate autism. Within uh, two to three years, he uh, came out of autism. Uh, initially, we found better improvement in cognition, learning, reading levels. Uh, then his grades went up, his sensory issues became lesser. He beca his uh, meltdown became lesser, his understanding improved, his brain functioning improved in terms of PET scan. You know, uh, in two years, his, uh, he became integrated from special class to a routine class, uh, normal class, and his grades, you can see his grades, and his grades are better than any neurotypical child too. <clears throat> Uh, then with highest GPA, uh, uh, he got a, uh, so you can see his pro journey from 2015 to 2017 uh, from 26 cards, he has come to 19.5 and 2018 it is 15.5, that is no autism. Apart from that, this is when he passed his, uh, he graduated from his uh, level, high levels from 12th grade. He went, he became part, he was part of a choir. He uh, participated in choir. He went on a tour to, from US to Ireland uh, along with the choir. And he's uh, given his, he's written his essays. And the latest is that he has got admitted admission in various different colleges. So this is about, his name is Ganesh, and he uh, resides in Kentucky, USA. Uh, the other improvement video is uh, Mercy Striplet's video is there online. You you can watch it, but I want to show you. This is a 13-year boy who came he, from Kenya, was practically inside his home. Uh, he had a lot of behavioral issues, meltdowns. Of course, he was non-verbal, but severe, severe behavioral issues and meltdowns and total inability to do any activities. You can see that his understanding and sitting tolerance, his communication, non-verbal, uh, chewing, uh, his behavior meltdowns became less, he became more social. He, started, he, was, he was now able to learn swimming and cycling. So this was about Victor. I one of my favorite examples is this very sweet young sweet child from South Africa. Uh, first time when he came, he was four years old. Then after a year, five year old, you can see the first time and second time. Although he was not at all focusing, there was no understanding. He was very restless. He would not sit in one place after the treatment. In a year, he he started vocalizing. He started sitting, concentrating. Uh, you know, learning improved, focus improved, following commands. So where there was nothing, he started learning. So that was a progress in six months to a year. And after the second treatment, uh, I got a message in 2020, November, in the peak of COVID. Uh, that is the next slide where this child who was completely non-verbal is now making stories. And, and uh, uh, these are spontaneous stories which he has made on his own. 
and he is vocalizing and what beautiful thing the mother actually messaged me was the foundation of the child's development when he was 4 years old and 5 years old actually helped him reach this stage the child is in regular school he is very good at reading he does mathematics of course in autism a few things may quirks may remain but this is a child who is now completely verbal and expresses beautifully with voice modulation <laughs> If you look at this child, would you ever, can you even, you know, see that he is autistic? So, of course, this goes on for three minutes. So, I'm going to let go. It was beautiful and a very, very interesting story he made. <clears throat> so, there are many, many such examples of children with autism that we have who have come out of the spectrum, some very young girls from Kenya who are now going to regular school, some doing exceptional, exceptional qualities uh, start seeing because now you start seeing the child in a different way. Uh, I tell everybody that, you know, we can't, we have not created the sun. The sun is right there. But there are some days where the clouds will prevent the sun from being seen. So what cell therapy is doing is removing the clouds and making the sun shine brighter or, or uh, appearing to be brighter so that's what is that what cell therapy is able to do in children with autism <laughs> let's look at uh, cerebral palsy cerebral palsy we know is again lack of oxygen or uh, perinatal injury to the brain leading to <coughs> severe brain damage could be monoplegia one side of the body affected both sides of the body uh, below the waist full body along with either there is spasticity or, or dystonia or ataxia and there can be different parts of the brain which are affected. Uh, you can see the PET scan here, it is a bit different from autism. You can see that this black part is completely dead, this will not recover, but the blue part around it is what is salvageable. <laughs> The treatments currently for cerebral palsy will be medication to reduce tightness or spasticity or dystonia, orthotics like splints, Botox injection to reduce the spasticity, of course, rehabilitation and surgical treatment like a rhizotomy to, uh, you know, uh, uh, cut open the nerve endings, nerves to be able to reduce the spasticity. The cellular therapy, what have we seen? That our data shows that uh, because cerebral palsy, each child is different again, and we group it into diplegia, quadriplegia, uh, and um, uh, uh, other types, which is a combination of dystonic cerebral palsy or uh, uh, ataxic cerebral palsy. We find that in diplegia, the tightness reduces, child's trunk control improves, able to stand with lesser base of support, is able to ambulate with support, but lesser support. The support may not go away completely, but it reduces. Uh, in case of quadriplegic cerebral palsy, we see improvement in oromotor, tongue movement, chewing, better cognition and understanding, better tracking, uh, visual tracking, then better neck holding, and then better sitting, use of hand, and then standing and walking. So in quadriplegic, it is a longer journey. So different scales also we see there is significant improvement. The child who is completely five or four can become three, or three can come to one. So depending on the severity, you will see them. If you look at the brain scan, this is one brain scan I like to show this. You can see this PET scan. This is a brain. Can you see from the side view the the blue part or damage? Green is fine. Okay, so the the damaged part you can see that now it is green. So the brain is now getting activated. Okay, so uh, this is a publication which is available online, uh, where which we have published our data as well as these are other scientific articles. Okay, let's see a few examples. Uh, I want to show a few videos. So this is a child we treated uh, when he was seven years old, was completely on the bed, uh, could not sit, stand or walk. 
is now in 22 months started speaking sentence able to walk able to uh, sit independently and go to school and can see the scale is improving these are clinical uh, um, scales for cerebral palsy and this is a brain scan you can see that this blue this is a brain before the treatment you can see all these blue areas damage on brain is completely active uh, people worry of, about the yellow and red the yellow and red is good functioning it is activated doesn't mean child is hyperactive, it just means that the brain is more active. <clears throat> this is a child from Kenya who was 14 years old and completely on the little chair when he came to us, uh, cognitively fine. Mm -hmm. And after the treatment with foot rehabilitation, he improved in terms of his functioning, hand functioning, <clears throat> wearing clothes, using the hand for fine activities walking by himself to the fridge, opening things. So this functional improvement, functionally the child improves. And we'll see then the was wheelchair bound is now walking without support. So back to So sorry, so the this is another video where a child who was not able to stand is able to now walk first with walker and then without support, first inside the house and then outside. So this is how the progression ha happened. But with cell therapy, you have to put good training and rehabilitation. It is very important. Mm -hmm. This is a brain scans which show improvement in the brain. This child was completely bedridden and very, very severe affectation, most sick, gradual improvement over a period of a year and a half and two years. Cerebral policy, we have to be patient, we have to keep working hard, but it is possible to get the child to at least have a good semblance of, you know, neck holding and sitting, be able to respond better and have a better quality life. Child was completely had no no uh, you know understanding of what's happening around the world. So at least attempting to walk. So depending on the severity, we would decide about the. This is a child from. Um, Turkey, you had absolutely no neck holding, slowly neck holding and trunk holding improved, sitting, his dystonia re uh, reduced, he's now able to sit with support, get up with support, lesser support. So the support reduces. So of course, every child is different. How much you work is also very important to the child. So these are a few examples. I'm not going to talk so much about intellectual disability. Again, it's a brain issue. The problem is in the brain. And again, we have we uh, this is the first ever publication on intellectual disability where we looked at two groups: only rehabilitation and cell therapy with rehabilitation. The take home in this graph is that uh, even with rehabilitation, you can see improvement. This is the orange bar. You can see improvement, mild, uh, no improvement, 20%, mild, 37, and, and significant, only 13. While when you combine with cellular therapy or stem cell therapy, the significant result is almost 62%. So that's that's important that when you combine, you get more significant uh, results. So you can see the brain functioning, the whole brain is atrophied. After the treatment, the whole brain is now fully active. 
So this is a publication, print scans. I am going to go now ahead so that I can take your questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is an example of a 20 year old intellectual disability who can now converse and say this is these are a few examples. I'm, <clears throat> I'm just going ahead now. Mm -hmm. But Down syndrome also can be treated with cell therapy. We are looking at the brain functioning in Down syndrome. We can't take care of the chromosomal anomaly, but the brain functioning can be improved. So you look at the complications. I think one of the major worries in parents is, you know, what are the complications? You know, we are taking cells, we are putting it near the brain. Uh, could there be tumors? Could there be, uh, you know, um, the child reversing, regressing? That is one of the major worries in uh, parents. You know, there are no major <coughs> irreversible neurological complications. There is nothing which cannot be rectified. Whatever happens is, is transient. For example, there can be a headache after the treatment. There can be a little pain, a little increase in hyperactivity for some time. And all that is reversible. Uh, in those who have a history of schizer, there can be a 3 to 6% chance of, of having a schizer after the treatment. Uh, if EEG is abnormal as well. So we medicate or uh, start on anti-epileptic medications to reduce it to less than 3% by proper medication. So it is possible to control the possible side effects, to minimize the side effects to very, very minimum. So this is Neurotin Brain and Spine Institute. All of you are most welcome. We have treated uh, more than 13,000, 14,000 patients from hundreds of countries with the world. This is where we do the treatment. We have two hospitals. One is Neurogen and other is the Neurogen Annex. Um, the, uh, and both are in this beautiful place uh, known as Navi Mumbai. This is our operation theater uh, where we do the pr uh, procedure and this is a, a cell laboratory, some cell laboratory where we do the processing of the cells and then after the injection, then rehabilitation and a one roof team. It is a team uh, exercise. We do rehabilitation together, multidisciplinary together is very important. Uh, so rehabilitation has its limitation and cell therapy enhances the results of the rehabilitation and reduces the limitations. The surface of therapy department, we believe in one-on-one -on -one care. <clears throat> this is the occupational therapy, autism child development center, aquatic therapy. This is the aquatic therapy in, in water where the therapy is done. Spinal cord injury walking tract where adult patients are treated, sensory integration, how to teach a child to work or play, speech, language therapy, art therapy, dance therapy. Of course, our other hospital where we also do a combination of cell therapy for neurological condition, but mainly for the uh, purpose of anti aging, and this I've already spoken about. <clears throat> So Neurogen, at Neurogen, we have published more than 18 books on various neurological uh, conditions as well as on COVID. Uh, this is our core team, accreditation. We are ISO and GLP, GMP certified. And we also are have uh, uh, been felicitated with a lot of awards, both uh, national and international. <clears throat> So this is our website. You all can reach us at neurogenpsi.com. A lot of information is available here. This is our email ID. And uh, with uh, Skype, we, we can do online consultations. And this is our phone number. Please do take down. Uh, each patient is uh, given a coordinator. who becomes your point of contact for everything that happens before the treatment as well as after. We have two treatment protocols, a one-week protocol and a two-week protocol. The one-week protocol, where patient comes on a Sunday, stays till Saturday. The two-week protocol comes on a Sunday, stays till next Saturday. And the two-week protocol 
apart from the, uh, from cell therapy and rehabilitation, we also add integrative therapies. For integrative therapies, two weeks stay is mandatory because we need to do at least 10 sessions of the oxygen therapy, otherwise it is useless. So why is neurogen different? What is different in neurogen? Uh, that's uh, neurogen is the only center in the world which focuses only on neurological condition. We have the largest number of scientific publications in the world. We have written book chapters, uh, and we have uh, and we have been in various international book books. Uh, we do cell therapy only for neurological cases because our team is neuro focused. We use very safe cells from the patient's own body, which do not have any tumorogenicity or ejection issues. And these cells are injected intrathecally into the spinal fluid to improve the brain functioning. We combine this treatment with comprehensive rehabilitation and oxygen-based therapy. We keep on uh, looking at how do we make the treatment more effective. We have treated 13,000 patients from over 75 different countries in the last 15 years. We have a vast body of experience and the whole treatment and process is monitored by very senior experienced professional in their own specialities. Uh, we are constantly researching and looking at how we can reverse the damage in the nervous system. And our, uh, our work is monitored by an ethics committee, which is uh, um, registered at the government level. So this makes us uh, different from all other centers where Multiple things are done together without any scientific validation or systemization. <clears throat> so we believe that and we have proved that adult cell therapy is safe and it is effective and can be used for autism, cerebral palsy and other pediatric and adult conditions. <laughs> The reason I played this video was everybody knows that or have has heard that stem cell is banned in the US, but it was banned in, in the year 2001 by President Bush. Uh, and stem cell was not banned. It was the federal funding for embryonic stem cell research, which was stopped. And in 2008, President Obama actually lifted this ban. So this is something, the, the subsequent which people don't know, and where he reposed his faith in the, in the field of regenerative medicine. So this is a journey of hope. This is a journey of going from hopelessness to hope a combination of cellular therapy, integrative therapy with rehabilitation. And I hope I have been able to get this uh, get this hope across uh, and um, and clear some of the doubts that you may have. Uh, I'm, of course, happy to answer questions now. I will be taking questions. I'm going to just, yeah. So I think there are some questions here. And thank you for patient hearing. Uh, so I can see... Uh, questions and I'm going to take them. At what age uh, recommended can one undergo procedure of intrathecal transplantation? Um, younger the better. So we have a criteria of at least 9 to 10 kilo kg weight for the child. <coughs> the, the youngest child for autism we have treated is 1.5 uh, uh, 15 months. So younger the better. So uh, yes, we can treat any child above 15 months. Are there any specific drugs that can be given to facilitate degeneration of stem cells or regeneration of stem cells? No, as no drugs are required. The cell, the cell stem cells uh, are, are very active and they will function. But oxygen therapy can help to enhance the result or multiplication of the stem cells. 
you went marry you came for for sure but you were afraid of the capsule uh, what if is a problem to open it like electricity or technical as a child cannot speak so one thing is a child will never go alone into the capsule uh, if i wish you would have gone and at least seen that because with the child it's the mother is inside or the father is inside while adult is always inside for any technical issues or electricity there are uh, fall back uh, issues there is always a backup generator Uh, no parent or child will remain inside for more than 5 minutes inside and it is oxygen inside so you will never be deprived of oxygen and it is a constant monitored process if electricity goes by default the pressure comes down and you can open uh, uh, there are safeguards and safety measures which are put in place so you can be rest assured that nothing like this uh, will uh, will happen the stem cell therapy take into account the cultural context and environment of patients undergoing transplantation now the stem cell therapy that we are doing is from the patient's own body so cultural uh, differences don't it is a human body and the brain that we are treating and using the patient's own cells so it's uh, we are not taking anything from outside we are not taking from another person or another body or culturally different or ethnically different person so it does not matter in terms of culture also in fact we are not using an embryo so no religious uh, sentiments are caught here so uh, across uh, the human or uh, mankind this uh, treatment can be used because these are the patient's own cells just like a cardiac bypass for example cardiac bypass what happen in cardiac bypass we take the veins from patient's own body and put in the heart cultural issues do not affect the outcome of the uh, by cardiac bypass surgery right similarly this is what is happening for example there is a, a fracture which is not healing what do we do we take bone marrow from the patient's own body and put it in the fracture area so that it heals this is the simple process when you talk about cells taking from outside there that's where you have to actually think of whether culturally similar or body will take it or not take it uh, so that is for allogenic cells does it help in intellectual disability yes it does help in intellectual disability uh, we see improvement in comprehension and learning and yes absolutely it helps for mlc1 leukodystrophy metachromatic leukodystrophy sadik um not a lot it is a degenerative condition we have treated a few all we we do not expect drastic changes in mlc it depends on what is the condition i am not saying that it will not help at all but it will not help drastically but it can improve if the its early stages of metachromatic leukodystrophy then it is possible to help uh Larry uh, Pululu, uh, the French webinar is at five p.m. That is about, uh, you know, an hour and a half from now. Please do join us. Um, I will try and answer some of the questions which are there. Can you call Satine? Satine Bolon. So I will call the French translator and try and understand what questions are you seeing that your child is four years old and. Uh, how can you contact us so i'm going to call the french translator just for this but we have a webinar in french in, in the next one and a half hours i hope you understood <clears throat> is there any side effects as i said no side effects uh, in in autologous cells only thing we do see sometimes transient increase in seizures if there is a history of seizure or eeg is abnormal there's a patient who has come uh, can you see this he is asking some question this is one that is holding up the heart is it possible to follow this uh, to follow see this webinar in online uh this uh, webinar is live uh and okay what is the next question Uh, if uh, my my child is four years old, and I'm living in BRC, mm. is there any contact? Okay, so uh, please join the five uh, uh, 
p.m. Uh, webinar. So about in an hour and a half, there will be a webinar in French. And uh, uh, Larry, if you could send your phone number here, my colleague Saturnin will connect with you. You want to translate that? <coughs> Bonjour, bonjour à tout le monde. Docteur Nandini dit, euh, comme vous avez dit, l'enfant a quatre ans, mais ne parle pas. Donc, si c'est possible que vous puissiez envoyer votre numéro de téléphone, comme ça, moi-même, je vais vous contacter après ce webinaire. Merci. Merci. Um, interesting to see how things have developed. It's very nice to see your parents and patients as well as professional, Easter from Netherlands. Thank you so much, Easter, for your comment. Rupinder, what would be costing for one week and two weeks? Rupinder Singh, uh, one of my colleagues, will reach out to you. And uh, once we know what is the patient's condition, we will be able to give you that information. So the Nawaz has asked, so the Nawaz for the first cycle, can we go only for cellular therapy? Uh, can I go down? Question is going away. Uh, can you go only for cellular therapy and then decide in the next cycle for integrative as well? Um, Dilnawaz, you, uh, you currently we have both options of one week and two week. Our experience uh, shows that two weeks really helps. Many parents, once they come here and then they, then they see and then they realize and then they want to extend. So might as well come for two weeks directly. But yes, you have the option of doing two weeks in the second treatment, no problem. But just for your understanding, many a times they come and then they feel, oh, we should have planned ahead. So just keeping uh, giving you a heads up there. Can we have your contact for benefit of from teaching and guidance for future specialization? Yes, please. Uh, our, for, our contact number is 9920. 200, 400, please reach out to us, email to us, and we will work on guidance for uh, for any professionals, yes. Can we have your contact for benefit of teaching? This is uh, Ruanga. Ruanga, are you from which part of the world are you from? Please do leave us some details here, or please email us. We will uh, see whether we can do some guidance or uh, we can you know, train you. Mm. How effective is the in ozone for the patient? Uh, Dev Mumaria, I hope you have uh, attended my webinar. I did show the difference that we are seeing uh, with just cell therapy and a combination of cell therapy and, and oxygen therapy. We find a very good enhanced result when we add oxygen-based therapy along with cell therapy. Does it help in cognitive skills and functional communication? Yes, cognition, understanding, learning, improves social awareness, improves, and that enhances and, and makes a, a child more sociable so that the uh, speech can be more functional. Yes, it, it, it does happen. Oscar, the cost, uh, each patient has to be evaluated first, and then uh, the cost, this is uh, academic, uh, information seminar and the cost will be explained to you directly by the coordinator. <clears throat> Daughter is two year old, has MLC and only problem is she has retardedness, less focus, she can walk, eat and run, laugh. Okay, great. So uh, if she, if at all she is in the initial phase, she has not started deteriorating, this is a good time to consider the treatment and we can definitely evaluate her for the treatment. Uh, at this time it is possible. Phone number? So, Larry uh, Pululu, we are taking on your phone number and Saturn and will communicate with you shortly. Thank you. Mercy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take a picture. Okay. So, I think we are at the end of the question answer session. I hope this uh, webinar was useful for all of you and uh, that we will uh, keep in touch with you. We will. Uh, uh, reach out to all those people who have attended this uh, webinar as well as those who have uh, not attended and you will be getting a video link of this webinar for, for your reference as well. So have a good weekend and take care.